I want to pray about the, the next speaker that's going to be up here pretty soon. <laughs> All right, so here's the story. You might wonder, well, why? We have a, <clears throat> another Tim Blue coming and speaking. The story, <clears throat> the story goes as Junior went up and spoke very eloquently and detailed and shared information. And as he came off, he was sufficiently lectured by the legend himself saying, you missed this and you missed that. What about this and that? So then we knew we needed to bring this guy, the legend, back for the full story. <laughs> in detail, in living color, by the legend himself. And I had a chance to talk, we were talking last week about <clears throat> The Salish Sea, about being on the water, and what it means, and what it is, and how we react. If you're a fisherman, or if you're a crabber, <clears throat> if you're a hunter, then you know what it is, and you know what it's like, you know, to travel in the same pathways as our ancestors, and just to be on that water, and to feel that water, to feel that water, or out in the woods hunting, like our ancestors did, just being out there in that time, in that place. <clears throat> You know, it's not just to, to, to make money. It's not just to, to bring <clears throat> in a food and a livelihood. But it's a wholesome, holistic, everything that it encompasses from a cultural perspective. Who you are, who we are, and what we are. <clears throat> and the thought of how, now this is an educational institution that we're in right now, but how our ancestors were engineers. They had to be engineers to survive. They had to be engineers to figure out how do we use metals and how do we use the cedar and how do we use the bark to make net. Because back then there was no nylon. There was no store that we could go and buy the things that we needed. And the reef netting, the engineering that goes behind it, <clears throat> the buoys, creating the buoys and the, and the, and the rocks, the right rocks. They're engineers, our ancestors, and to be proud of that, to hold our head up high. So we're going to learn a little bit about that today <clears throat> as he speaks on five generations. Five generations. I, again, I'm glad that each and every one of you are here. Put your hands together if you enjoy the sound that you have. Mm -hmm. That's another thing about our native people that we use humor. And so we're not going to just talk for the, for the whole hour, but we're, we're going to also, Tim's going to also invite you to, to any questions that you have. There's no such thing as a bad question, I, I tell my uh, students. There's no such thing as a bad question. Remember those days? <laughs> when I see some of my former students in this room. So I myself am glad to be here with you. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to Emma for a little bit. She has a few more words before we bring up the legend. <laughs> Thank you, Ray, very much. I won't add uh, much more, but I just wanted to say, on behalf of the Native Environmental Science Program at Northwest Union College, and in recognition and acknowledgement that we're all on, on the Canadian traditional territory of the Lummi Nation, the Coast Salish, I just want to thank you for being here. Thanks for those. Can I have a show of hands for those that this is their first time ever at Northwest Indian College? So this is a wonderful welcome, um, that, and it's good to have you here. Um, and can I also have the those that are students? Um, can you raise your hands or stand up? Can I have a student of can I have Native Environmental Science at Northwest Indian College? Wonderful. So the reason I bring that up as well is because this is our next generation. These are the future leaders in our in our midst. So just to give you a little bit of a context of the Salish Sea Speaker Series, this is the third of them. Um, Chairman Ballou, Tim Ballou, or Timmy, <laughs> he's not here so we can say that, um, uh, was our very first um, Salish Sea Speaker. And it was appropriate to do that because this was before the treaty win. So this was, there was a lot of momentum. We were all really hoping and there was a lot on the line. And thankfully now we know that um, the Army Corps made the right decision this time, right? And so that was in the anticipation. Yeah. So this is part of the ongoing and hard work that we do, that we do at Northwest Indian College, that Lummi Nation and LIBC do, that Coast Salish and the Swinomish communities and the other 
um, allies working together to do what is right. Um, and so that is why bringing everybody together to talk about one thing that I think that we can all agree on, regardless of where we are, even on the uh, political spectrum, we can all agree on the importance of water. And so if we are going to bring people together to have meaningful dialogue, let's talk about something that we love. And I think we all love the Salish Sea. I think that's why we're here. We love the Salish Sea. And who are the people that know the Salish Sea the most are the people that have lived here for the longest. That have, their culture has come up within um, the Salish Sea and its mountains and its waters. And so with that, um, it's my true, true honor um, to have Tim Ballou Sr. be our uh, third Salish speaker. The speaker before was Larry Campbell from Plumish and Jamie Donna who did an amazing job talking about the indigenous health indicator. Um, and having Tim Ballou Sr. here um, is absolutely fantastic from the Native Environmental Science Program perspective. He's really rounded out our program and uh, I'm honored to be part of our faculty. He's mentors for our students and um, he's just a wonderful person. <laughs> so within that, he also knows of the waters very well. And um, he humbly agreed and graciously agreed to speak about the waters of five So with that, um, can we all welcome Tim Lucy for our safety. First of all, I want to welcome everybody to Lummi and thank Northwest Indian College for hosting this event. I truly believe it's an important thing that we discuss and plan for the future for what we call the state of the sea. But before I begin, I was kind of under arrest by Emma <laughs> to do this project. Um, it was true, I kind of told my son he missed a few things. That's okay. <laughs> um, I need to introduce some people to you guys first. Um, really my support, my back backbone, and my loving family. First of all, my wife Laurel from the Swinomish tribe. Our youngest son Raymond Blue is mate Nyla Cause from Lummi. Our mother Ernestine Jensa and relatives from Swinomish. But I thank you guys for being here today. And I thank the students from the Swinomish tribe for making this journey and the, the visitors. As Rudy said, um, I really want to hear from you guys a little bit too. And uh, you know, the Sailor Sea, what we call today, is a very important thing, not only for me, as a Native American or a Lummi member, but I think it's important to everybody as we really look into the real situation we're facing today. I've been um, had the privilege to be on the water for 52 years now. And um, with those 52 years, I've really experienced change and with that change, as Native Americans, we have to change along with the water. Um, I read a book one time and um, this person said, water has no boundaries. <laughs> and you know, that's very true. And so we talk about water in the classes I teach. But I chose five generations for a particular reason. Um, I'll back up a little bit, or did I say this? I'm from the Bolts, Celestine family, the Solomon Blue family. With the first family I mentioned is our great grandmother's family, where she comes from. They are originally from Squim, Washington territory, and the story goes, they came to this territory for a particular reason. They utilized and trusted the Salish Sea back then and traveled in their canoes. And, you know, it was the late 1800s back then, and they, they believed in the water. The water was really a sacred thing to them. It was a spiritual thing for them. And the story she carried with that, she talked about things about the water 
but she never told us what to do with the water. She was kind of a, um, she, she didn't say, this is what you have to do. She always explained, this is how we do it, and this is what we should do. So, you know, that was a lot of um, foundation for us. She talked about how they travel for 10 days, <coughs> seven times of the tide. And, you know, those are amazing things to jump in a canoe and travel and gather. You know, as we are Native Americans, just like any other people, we plan and we gather. And I, I really hope that we all do that today and we still remember some of the things that we're supposed to do. And I guess I'll be really straightforward and blunt. Sometimes this younger generation is afraid to do those kind of things because the culture's changing throughout the whole world. The media's changing of um, Go Pokemon or whatever. <laughs> but you know, that's who we are. Yeah, but still they remember who, who they are and where they come from. Every, every day in class, at Northwest Indian College, I encourage the students to remember who they are, where they come from, and life is going to be so much easier for them. If we don't have that foundation, it's going to be difficult to succeed in whatever we want to do. But back to our grandmother, our great-grandmother. She studied, she studied the cloud, she studied the birds, she listened to them more importantly, and she studied Mount Baker. She used to talk about those things on a Sunday afternoon. Our mother <coughs> made us go sit in the living room and listen. And um, back then it was a little bit different. We really couldn't talk. We had to just sit and listen. We were a different, different culture back then. And that's okay. Um, with her <coughs> discussions she had with us, really defined us as who we were as family and community members of the Lummi Nation. <coughs> Just as the Sailor Sea is, the Sailor Sea <coughs> defined us as a people, that defined us as what we were going to do in this territory. And the Sailor Sea is really a sacred place for me. And I really hope it's a sacred place for my boys and grand grandkids. I consider it sacred. I consider it spiritual. As you heard earlier from my good friend brother here, the song came from the canoe. The power of the water is um, underestimated today. I truly believe if we sit there, go out in the water and listen, something's going to come good you'll have something good in your life that's going to benefit you for the rest of your life. That's the power of the sea, I think. I guess in the same breath, sail the sea needs help. It's um, not destroyed. I truly believe it needs help. And I hope some of the students that attend Northwest Indian College are going to be those people who are going to stand up and help change not only them, but our neighboring communities. We need your help as much as us need yours. And the Sailor Sea, I think it's tired. You know, the only reason why I say that is things change out there since our great-grandmother. She talked about what it was like, what the water was like, how clear the water is, and what it looks like today. So, you know, I think we need to help it. And I don't think it takes much to change, but it needs help. I'm going to drop down to my grandma, grandfather, um, Casmer Ballou. <coughs> we, we grew up in the fishing village here in our community along Nooksack River. There was 240 residents there at, at that moment in time. 
the river was just as important to us as the so-called Salish Sea. When I was young, the Nooksack River used to be 25 to 30 feet deep. You could see bottom. Now it's about three feet deep, and you still can't see bottom. So, you know, we were kind of a little bit um, behind the gun. When I say we, the Lummi Nation, we tried to stop practice, the practice of logging in our mountains and we were a little bit too late but however we kind of forced a buffer zone I still believe the buffer zone is not large enough to protect the water from Mount Baker. So Grandpa Casmer, my father and I, we used to traveled to Susha Island and Petus Island when I was probably six or seven in the winter time. And um, we traveled on a 16-foot boat and it was foggy and I still can't figure out really how they did it without compasses. Um, he said we have to listen to the waves sometimes um, but we made it to Petus Island in the fog and um, we harvested bottom fish at that moment. <laughs> Actually, you know, there was so much bottom fish, you know, it, it provided a resource for our family, it fed our family, and we continued to do that until um, my teenage years. <clears throat> Actually, you know, it wasn't just Pedos Island or Susha Island, it, it was throughout the Hales Pass area where we used to harvest bottom fish. You know, February, March, it's probably, what, 15 degrees. One of my first trips with them, it was um, so cold and my, I was crying. And my grandfather <coughs> laughed at me and he took me to the beach and built a big farm. And he said, you need to utilize resources. So they left me on the beach for probably a couple hours until they thawed out. But then we went back into the water. You know, those are just the way we used to utilize and live off the water when I was a kid. So I fished with my grandfather, really different generation than my father. I was 11 years old when I was an owner operator of my first fishing boat. And I thought I was a the man then. <laughs> but my mother kind of said, no, you have to kind of leave. <laughs> but you know, being 11, owner operator, we have responsibilities. We have to understand really what's out there on the water and how to, I guess, read what's going on. You know, being out in the, the so-called Salish Sea, we never called it the Salish Sea back then. We, um, we were able to detect or smell the water, what the tide was going to do. If it was going to blow or if it was going to be salmon. So, you know, it's different today. Sometimes there's just no smell out here. And it's a terrible thing, I think. But these are just memories and experiences I've been through. So, you know, as I grew, by the time I was 18 years old, I was a multi-boat owner. And that was a good thing, I guess, sometimes. But, you know, it's really hard to manage three boats on a 12-month basis. So, you know, later on in life, I kind of um, scaled back and uh, just went to one boat. But our grandfather talked about those kind of things. He, he I won't use the word he used, but you know, he, he said we shouldn't be that way. He didn't really tell us we had to be stewards of the resource, but that's really what he was telling me. And um, it's kind of hard to do, yeah? to be a steward, to be responsible for the water. 
We live so quick and so fast today, we kind of forget about where we are in life. So, you know, it was a very interesting thing how our grandfather instructed us and how he taught us and how he cared for us when we were on the water. Back in those days, they understood everything about the water. I think one of the biggest reasons was um, they didn't have high-speed boats back then. They really traveled. They planned their day around the tide. We, he said, we wait for the tide to go out. We wait for the tide to come in. You never rush. You know, however, when he passed, I started to rush. And when we rush, within the water, we're not really respecting the water, I believe. And you know, it's a thing that we all have to learn. My youngest son, used to, he started fishing when he was six. But he chose to go the education route, like his mother, which is really good. He knows what he wants, he knows what he wants to do. <clears throat> so, our father, Richard Ballou, he was a dedicated fisher person. He understood what he had to do in the water. <clears throat> he talked about what it was like when he was a teenager and the uh, difficulties and trials that he had and, um, you know, we were going through a transition at that moment in the resource, I believe. We couldn't um, plan ahead. We couldn't um, make good decisions, I think, on the fishing grounds. He talked about when he used, was a young person when he fished with other people. But, you know, fishing was difficult back then, I believe, you know. They didn't have the boats we had, they didn't have the tools we have today. So, you know, he worked a job to continue his practice in fishing. And there's nothing wrong with that. I, I still have to do that. I'm so glad that it gives me time off sometimes when I want to be with the water. And it's really part of a healing process for me, and I know it was a healing process for our father. So when, when it was my turn to be on my own for fishing, I seen the best, I think, and I seen the worst in fishing, commercial fishing. <clears throat> when I speak about the best, I can recall going out to the Puget Sound and um, seeing fish jump as far as I could see. It looked like raindrops. And we were struggling as a nation and we were struggling with the um, international border with the Canadian fisheries and they were concerned about overfishing the fish back then. So, you know, they developed a board and um, we made a big mistake, I think, one year. There was so much fish in Canada, the sockeye salmon, that they dynamate, dynamated the lake. And they were worried about suffocation, the oxygen. And with that, we kind of lost the cycle, I believe, of salmon. And. Um, a lot of people probably know about it, a lot of people probably don't know about it, but that's what happened. It kind of decreased our stock. And that was a decision by the government in Canada. So, you know, the effects that they have, their concerns, it affects us as um, United States fisher people. So, you know, a lot of things that happen to our resource that um, nobody knows. So, you know, it's, um, 
or I should say we need to start an education process. I truly believe that. And um, it, it's, it's going to take time, I think. And I think we have to give and take as we go. We learned from that incident that we needed each other. Tribal fishermen and state fishermen needed each other. We held a big, I don't want to say a rally, but a meeting at the Mount Baker Theater about our concerns about the salmon. And it was a great start. You know, it wasn't us against them, them against us. We need each other. And I truly believe that's what we need to do for the Salish Sea. Um, I, I really hope that if you haven't been on Sailor's Sea before, please do it before it may be too late in some, some areas. So when I was growing up, we spent a lot of time on the islands. I'm going to back up. I forgot to introduce my brother, Paul. He's younger than I am. He, um, I, I think he spent just as much time on the water as I did. He, he lived on the water. He witnessed gray whales giving birth in Orcas or, um, Susha Island. He witnessed a lot of things. The king salmon in East Down. And he was really... Um, he spent a lot of time, I think, more than he should have. But, you know, that's what he chose to do. So we all have our place in our families, and um, we, we have to continue to share some of these stories to strengthen who we are as people. And I think we need your guys' help as well. We, I really, truly wish that the salmon were healthy again, but I was told by an elder, believe in the salmon, if you believe the salmon are going to not be back, they're not going to be back. And um, that's the spirituality of the salmon, I think. Um, we all know what sockeye salmon is, yeah? They pass through our waters into the Canadian um, streams. Probably 25, maybe 28 years ago, one of my uncles stopped while I was at Point Roberts, and he talked about the sockeye salmon. He, he goes, Tim, do you know what the powerful fish is? And, you know, I, everybody thinks the king salmon, the Chinook, is the powerful fish because it's so big. But the sockeye salmon helped this community, these families in this community, create an event invent a um, way of fishing, the reef net fishing. And that's what he really was talking about, the power of the salmon, listening to the salmon, and how the salmon really gave up their life to provide for us as Native Americans in this community. And you know, I, after giving the thought, it's true what that sockeye salmon is, but still we have to have that belief and those ears to really listen. And like Rudy talked about the water and the canoe and the song, that's what it's all about. We're told to watch and listen to a certain bird when we're out in the sailor's sea. They're going to guide us to what we're looking for. So, you know, again, it's the spiritual belief for some families. And you know, sometimes we don't do that. That's okay, I guess. But you know, I know individuals still today in my family that they feed the water and they talk to the water on a daily basis. That's the belief that we have, and I believe that's the belief we all had 40, 50 years ago when it was a healthy sea. And, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see where we go as a people, not maybe five, ten years from now, if we're going to be able to help it. So, um, let's 
story about our son, Tim, Tim Blue, to his mother. You're going to school, you're going to school, you're going to school. So I was very proud that Laurel and Tim were at Western at the same time. They were going to graduate together. They had plans of that. He was going to have a fantastic job after he finished college. So he found a job, worked for a couple years, came home and told his mother, I bought a boat. <laughs> I bought a commercial boat. And she had a couple choice boat words to say. <laughs> It was really comical, but Tim came fishing with me just as our youngest son did. He understood the fish, he understood the weather. I didn't want to tell him at that moment in time that he had a gift to have the fish come to him. Laurel's father lived with us, he'd go out fishing, he'd come home with Six, seven hundred pounds within two hours, and Laurel's dad said, What the hell's going on here? And I said, He understands the water, Grandpa. And, um, you, know, it, you know, it's those kind of things that we need to cultivate, I think, as Native American people. And later on, Laurel finally um, said it was okay, I think. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, he decided to do the same thing. He decided to be a monster. And, uh, you know, with that we have to have more responsibility and more respect. And um, a couple of years ago, we had a little incident <coughs> in the water. Not me. Our, our son called me up maybe 7.50 in the morning, and he said, Dad, I flipped over. And so I couldn't get a hold of Laurel, and you know, that's some of the worst things that uh, I think a lady, a mother, or a grandmother could hear, that your son has flipped over. And um, of course, the emotions came into play, and. Laurel goes, kind of hits me, and she goes, aren't you worried? <coughs> and you know, uh, of course I was worried, but I believed in him. I believed in who he was as an individual. I believed in his capabilities of fishing. I believed that he understood the water, which is sacred. So we went through that little trial, and still today, our son jokes about it. He said, all my risks are gone. You have to be worried, Dad. <laughs> and you know, maybe that's true, but I don't, I don't believe that. I really think that my connection, my rapport, or whatever we want to call it, with the water, I think we are relatives. That's my belief. I'm not going to have beliefs from administration. Um, you know, yes, as Emma mentioned, one of the talks was about the discussion of Cherry Point. Um, that's their business. If they ask my opinion, I'd let them know. But I don't want to get politics. Um, this, is, this is who I was. Um, so, today, my son Tim, my son Raymond, myself, and my grandson, our oldest grandson, we spend time on the water. We spend commercial fishing time on the water. And I really think that's healthy, even though he's he was eight years old when he first started fishing with us. He's seen some weather. When I speak about weather, you know, 20, 30 mile an hour winds. And 
he understood being that young. And he understood the clouds. He understood the lightning. And so we talked about those kind of things, really with the <coughs> myths and stories we hear as we grow up. The Thunderbird, what, what is the Thunderbird? So he comes fishing with us quite often, I think. And somebody asked, why do you do that? And my only response is, that's sovereignty. That's lummy or blue sovereignty. That's who we are. That's who we're always going to be. Nobody's really going to tell us what to do or how to do it. We'll abide by the rules and regulations. And it's not going to be up to me to have our grandson become a fisherman. I really think it's going to be a voice from his father and probably his grandmother. Um, you know, I, I sure wish I could speak about other tribes fishing. Laurel's father spent probably 50 years, 60 years on the water from Alaska to California. But I can't tell this story because that's his story. We all have a story of who we are as Native Americans, Lummi members, or Swinomish members. And mine is just about the relationship with the water. A true relationship. It's almost like a marriage, I think. Understanding what the water really is, the sail of sea. And this year, the program, Emma's program, they're going to study the Nooksack River. And I think that's going to be a really great thing. I really hope that the people that are studying the Nooksack River understands what it is. We, we spoke about really where the river came from. It was once part of the Fraser River years ago. That's why the topography of this area looks the way it looks. We talked about what the river provides. I think, um, I think some of the people understood that. But again, we didn't talk about the spirituality of the river. And I think that's important to talk about later on once the class really starts to get under way with the river. Um, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a life learning experience, I truly believe that. And I'm hoping our son Tim and I utilize some of the things they research with the river. Again, I can't tell them what to do because that's their job. You know, we need to build that relationship and hopefully with Emma's influence we'll do it. Right, Emma? <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm, I'm just about ready to quit, I think. I want to field some questions. Um, I really hope you have questions. Um, I think I could answer them. Um, I served four terms on the Lummi Indian Business Council. I kind of understand what they're doing, but again, I'm not going to tell them what to do. Um, the, I think they're doing a very good job, but we all can do more. And, uh, you know, I want to hear your thoughts. I want to. Um, try to help you answer questions. Uh, you know, there's always an answer, I believe. And I know Donna has questions. <laughs> she always has questions in class. And she's, uh, <laughs> you know, she's, uh, she inspires the class. And that's what we need, some people like that in our life. Just if it's for a moment in time. And you know, that's how we advance, that's how we really build our foundation of who we are as people. And um, we shouldn't be ashamed of those kind of things. 
I'm not picking on you, Donna. <laughs> I'm just observing. And, you know, I want to help you get to where you want to get. We all have a journey. When I first came here, I told Emma, my journey's almost done. <laughs> <laughs> really, what I want is, I want to go back time, full time in the water. That's my ultimate goal. Even though people may object about that, but that's what I want. Um, I'm more at peace in the water. My personality, just like all the other fisher people, we change as soon as we get on the boat. Some is good and some is bad. <laughs> but we change as a person. It's your true thing. Again, we have to have that respect. And I guess I'll talk a little bit about one of the students had a question about the water last week. We were talking about <clears throat> really what the fishing was, how we respect fishing, and a student asked the hard question, what about death? Are you guys afraid of death? So you know, I've had two cousins in our family die on the water, but we chose that life, we understood that life, and it's not a risk, it's just a way of life. And after the deaths, of course the older people came and said, this is what you have to do. You have to continue, don't let it stop. So you know, we do talk about those kind of things. Um, it's really not public, but you know, as families we talk about those kind of things. And, uh, we have to respect the water. I'm going to continue to say that. Some things I don't understand. You know, um, we have a new faculty here from California. I've been kind of questioning her about water and why the water looks the way it is. Why is it that way? And uh, we need people like her to really plan for what the water is going to be like and how we're going to change. So, I want to thank you guys again. Um, please, if you have questions, ask questions. And, you know, I know you took time out of your life to be here today. I don't want to keep you guys. Um, it's an important subject. I really thank Northwest Indian College for really looking into this and seeing really what, what is the sale of sea. But these are my views, they're not LRBC's views, they're not the college views. It's just living experience, what I've lived through. So you know, it, it's my views. Um, I do know we need to help the sale of sea. So, I'm gonna ask if there's any questions. Well, that's it, thank you, Tim. <laughs>
Do you know what that is? You can be honest. Yeah, I do. But yeah, you know, th those kind of things are what came to us. Um, we don't own the songs. Well, we're, we weren't supposed to claim them. Um, they just come down. I think every family that lived here had that experience. I truly believe that I don't believe it's um, written down in text, um, oral tradition, right? Um, when I was living there with our family, I didn't know there was a Gooseberry Point or a Sandy Point or a Bellingham. I never knew that. Um, I thought that was the whole world down here until we left in 1960. And um, I didn't know where we were going, um, why we were leaving our grandfather. Uh, but you know, it was uh, really a good life. Um, we didn't know what the, um, the word money was. We, we gathered our salmon and stuff that we needed for the year, for the winter, and uh, that's just the way we lived, yeah. Uh, every year we flooded, and I could never figure out why this white carry-all truck with the Red Cross was coming through the flood to try to make us leave. And we, we stayed. We stayed throughout the whole flood back then. And, you know, it was um, just common. We, we didn't leave, even though Red Cross was trying to help us, I guess. But I don't think we need to help, my personal opinion. 
because nothing ever happened to us. But sometimes, uh, I can't remember the last time they had a um, dinner for the people that lived down at the village. The River Red dinner, all um, years ago, most, maybe. It was all the people that lived there. Um, they called this River Rats from the Ferndale School District area. They labeled us as River Rats because we oh. still live along the exact river. And, um, I think sometimes we didn't take offense to that. Um, but later on in life, you know, some of the older people said, you know, that was wrong. But, uh, that's who we were at that moment. I don't think it's documented. Yeah, I, I've heard another person say that the, the walls were so thin they could pull their, put their finger through them and they remember the flooding. But they didn't know they were poor because they were, they were happy there. Mm -hmm. And that's such a great <coughs> piece to, to know about. They were happy there. I think we were rich myself. Um, every home had a fish smokehouse. Every fall time there'd be two or three hundred fish in the smokehouse. Uh, you know, there was really no worries in life. And it would be nice to be there today. But it's tough to go back, yeah? And you speak very highly of, excuse me, of respect and preparedness, you know, for being on the water. Um, as a sailor, I understand that, and that sense too. My question is, your grandfather's time, how did he prepare for bad weather, big waves, compared to what you folks, your, your family does now? Uh, nowadays, we've got survival suits and PFDs and things like that to help, help us. Not so, not so much available back then. <laughs> so when our grandfather spoke about his time fishing, we have to remember that um, they didn't have the luxury. They didn't have some of the same things we have today. When he was on a purse-saying boat, he talked about fishing on a turntable purse-saying boat. I'm hoping everybody knows what it is, yeah? Um, a turntable fishing same boat was the back end of the same boat turned to make it easier to retrieve the same net. It wasn't um, just a mechanical. He talked about um, he was the skiff person for the same boat, and he said they had to row, row the net out. So, you know, a lot of difference, yeah? Yeah. But, um, again, if it wasn't for these people, we wouldn't be where we're at today as fisher people, uh, as people of the water, because I surely think that they had the same respect we were handed down. And, um, yes, we all take risks at times. Um, I recall fishing with Laurel's father. We were setting out crab pots in an 80 mile an hour wind, which is probably wrong, yeah? <laughs> but uh, we did it because I think he and I were not afraid of the water at that time. And, you know, we all probably make those kind of mistakes in life, but we're still here because of that belief. <laughs> And uh, our oldest son, uh, we set crack lots out in 50 mile an hour winds on the smaller boats. We're still here. Uh, we have to understand really the movement of the water, the tide. Uh, I was talking to Emma about, you know, we study the moon really when to do things. And, uh, so I think we had the same thing, same respect for the water and uh, 
Yes, they probably didn't have survival suits back then. Mm -hmm. They were the ones that helped us out. One more um, question. Uh, well, again, uh, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you so much for your hospitality and inviting us. Um, I'm from Western, and I'm uh, sorry, I'm a little talker. <laughs> I'll stand up. Um, and uh, I'm involved with some environmental groups and on campus. And I'm just wondering, in your opinion, are, what are things that students on campus can do to help the Salish Sea while they're at the university? More importantly, I think you have to decide what you're going to do once you leave the university. Um, I think I, I try to encourage people to develop a roadmap of where they're going to be five years from now, ten years from now. Those are some of the questions I pose to our students at the end of the quarter. What's happening ten years from now related to what they're studying? And um, I always try to encourage them to say, I'm not going to read history, I'm going to make history. Mm -hmm. And some of them are going to do that. Um, they're going to prevail, they're, the, they're going to succeed. Because we as Northwest faculty, we believe in them. And we have to believe in them. Because they're the ones that make up the Northwest Indian College, just as well as your schooling up there. Um, there's a lot you can do. Um, we can do a lot just by a, a email or a letter to somebody. But it depends on really, really what you want out of your life. I can't tell you what to do, but I, I can hope you do something, something good. My name is Joy, and I too appreciate greatly your your talking here. I'm from I'm land people from the East of the Mountains, and my question to you is: Given your knowledge from the sea, from the waters, what is it that you know that we don't know, those of us who live in the city or live in the governments, about justice, about honor, about our land and our waters in the future? If we're building a roadmap to the future, what do you know that you would give us in, in wisdom that we can't know because we aren't there? We really have to look at habitat. If we ignore habitat, close the door on habitat, I, I think that we're going to be in a tougher situation 10 years from now. Um, how they practice farming, how they practice the dairy and berry, the practice of logging. Um, we need to have that relationship with British Columbia. If there's no relationship with British Columbia, you know, there's going to be still that concern about the sewer going into the sea. You know, we need to, I, I really think that we need to go internationally, not just locally. Um, we need international help for our home territory. That's my own view, my own opinion. Um, education, we need to continue to educate really what's going on in the rivers. A lot of us really don't know what's happening for a river. Um, my cousin, he always starts out in his speech about the river. It's dead, it's dead, it's dead. But I don't believe that. There's still water coming down. We have to really look at the glacier. You know, it receded probably a mile within five years. The water temperature has changed for the past 20 years in Bellingham Bay. <clears throat> we allowed Georgia Pacific to do what they did without trying to fix what they really did to Bellingham Bay. Uh, there's probably two feet of sludge in the middle of the bay that has happened from Georgia Pacific. And um, we 
try to continue to convince people we need to clean it up. So, you know, um, we need that report. And um, sometimes we talk upon deaf ears. Um, sometimes they think their priorities are more important than our territory. We have to remember the Salish Sea, the Nooksack River, made us who we are today as people from this area. If it wasn't for those two things, we'd be just like um, Chicago or New York, in my, my view. But yeah, we can do a lot. Thank you very much. So can we all join me in that? Thank you. Thank you. 